you turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, uh, we're going to examine the household of God, edification and edifying. And if you look at the, the topic at hand this evening in view of what we've been studying in the book of Ephesians on Sundays and coming out of the conference, uh, all of this kind of goes hand in hand. And I wanted to deal with each one of these and kind of go through a flow again of being a part of the household of God, His process of building His house, and then our role in the edification process. Not so much our role in connection with Him, although it is that, but our role in connection with one another. And so we're just going to touch on these things. Again, the household of God what it is, how do we become a part of it, edification, the process of God building us up, and edifying the role that we have in God's building. And there's many places we could go in connection with this, but I want to look at Ephesians chapter 3. And we're just going to read from verses 14 down to verse 19 as part of his prayer here. Uh, Have a word of prayer ourselves, and then begin. Ephesians chapter 3, and starting in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time to examine your word and to examine this wonderful issue of your house and how you build and how we can labor together with you so that we don't have to come with any curiosity or ignorance when it comes to what you're doing today and what you're producing, what you're working, and what we get to be a part of. And so we give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. So the first thing I want to deal with is, again, the the household of God. If you look here at Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to be bouncing all over, but um, just to to take a look at our text, he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You have the whole family. The whole family consists of being in heaven and earth. But then he says, for this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in which this whole family in heaven and earth is named. Okay, If you jump back to Ephesians chapter 2, we see in verse 19, he says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the, what? The household of God. And so we have this household terminology And then in Ephesians chapter 3, we see this family terminology. And that's what a household is. A a household is those that belong to a family. That's That's the imagery of the household. And yet there's something else that's being described in Ephesians 2 concerning this household. And that is like a a a structure. In verse 20, he says, and are built. So the household here is also in view of, of a of a house. So in one sense, it's a, it's a family, but in, there is another sense in which we think about this in regards to a structure. He says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So we see this household of God is a built, it's got a foundation to it, and the individuals here that he's speaking to are built upon that foundation. So although it's a structure, it's really, in one sense, a spiritual structure, is it not? He says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ himself is described as the chief cornerstone of this building, and therefore we know it is spiritual, but the, the imagery that we get, of course, is, a, is of a physical structure. And the, the saints here at Ephesus are a part of this household of God, and they're being built upon the foundation. They're being built upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And how are they being built upon the Lord Jesus Christ, in a sense? 
And how did they become a part of this household? Verse 22, 21, he says, in whom? In verse 22, he also says, in whom? In other words, to be a part of this household of God, we need to be in Christ. We need to have our identity changed from where we were in Adam to now being in Christ. And when we're in Christ, we become a part of this household. And it's this issue that I want to examine a little bit more. And so we got the, the family issue, becoming a, a part of the family of God by natural generation, if I can put it that way, uh, from coming from Adam and this issue of blood, we are, we are kin to Adam. Our, our faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ makes us kin to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we become a part of the family of God. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, just sticking here in this epistle, in verse 7, he says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Jump down to verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. So in verse 7 you have the redemption through His blood. That's going to be the means by which we are able to be a part of the family of God in Christ. And in verse 13, the response that we are to have to become a part of this family. So we need the provision of His blood, and then we need the response. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when we hear the gospel of our salvation and we trust it, we then benefit because that, in that gospel of our salvation is that redemption through His blood, that when we believe it, we become a part of the family of God. We become a part of this household. And we are built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment that we believe, we are regenerated. Come over to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And if you look at verse 4 with me, Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. So as we, again, we take a look at the household of God. How is it that we become a part of His household? It's by believing the gospel. That gospel contains the redemption through His blood. And when we believe it, we are identified as His family in other passages where the sons and daughters of God, we become the children of God, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And the process that takes place when we hear the gospel and believe it, there's an operation that goes on. Verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so, not only are we declared righteous, but He, he quickens us and He regenerates us. He says that in verse 5. So we have natural generation, if we can put it that way, in connection with Adam, and we need a regeneration that takes place of the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual operation. And notice here he says, by the washing of regeneration. Come over to chapter 2 of Titus. Titus chapter 2, and look at verse 14. Here he doesn't use the word washing, but he utilizes the word purifying. And you can purify by fire, you can purify by water, in kind of the natural realms. But notice what he says here in connection with Christ. Verse 14, he says, "...who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity." and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So we are purified by Christ giving himself for us. There's a washing of regeneration. Come over to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse 26. Here he's talking about husbands, two husbands and wives. But then you get down to verse 32. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And therefore, the primary context is Christ and the church with a secondary application to husbands and wives. But he says in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So he loved the church 
He gave Himself for it. And when He gave Himself for it, there's a purpose for that. Verse 26, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the what? By the Word. Okay? And so there's a regeneration that takes place. There's a, there's a washing in connection with this regeneration. Not of physical water, but of spiritual water, if I can put it that way. That spiritual water being the Word of God. It's the gospel of the salvation that we took a look at in Ephesians chapter 1. And when we believe that, there's a, there's a washing that takes place. There's a cleansing that takes place. There's a purifying that takes place. Now, we're going to eventually... I'm going to eventually bring this up, so let me try to bring it up now. Let me try to illustrate this in this sense. Let's say this is, this is you. But specifically, this is your heart. And we could go through a host of passages in regards to what the heart is by nature, right? It's deceitful, desperately wicked. It's, our foolish heart was darkened all these kind of things, right? But there's the heart. And the heart has the capacity of faith to believe. The problem with the heart in connection with faith and to believe, there's nothing really uh, that can deliver it. Nothing that can save it. All the affections and all the things of this world and what it might pursue and go after cannot save the heart. Cannot save the individual but it has that capacity. That's where he says in Romans chapter 6, you have believed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Okay? But what ends, up coming, what ends up taking place is there's a couple ways we can illustrate this. Uh, he, he illustrates it as a, as a seed in some places. So a, a, a seed. We talked about the issue of, that, of blood. These are my little symbols. All right, and, and the light, the heart is darkened, and you have light, okay? Um, all these things can represent essentially the Word or the Gospel, the Gospel of the grace of God, of course, okay? And what that does is that God provides that, right? You have the cross, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection, right? The ascension. That's the, that's the act of redemption. That's the, that's the provision. And then it gets packaged in the gospel. Okay? And that gets brought to, by words, it gets brought to our heart. Okay? The word when you when you hear the word of God, right? There's, there's that seed. If if you were to think about this in connection with generation, that is the issue of conception. When the seed of the man, right, enters in and and is working to fertilize the egg in the woman, right? The the egg of the woman would represent the the heart. The seed of the man would represent the gospel, the word of God. And, and what infuses them, what joins them together, is their, the, the light of it, but then also believing in it. And then that meets, and now there's a whole change that takes place to the heart. Because now that is allowed in, and you have, you have light in here. And you have blood, right, by faith. And you have... You have this seed of the Word of God. And there's a cleansing, there's a washing, and there's a, there's a regeneration, therefore, that takes place in connection with the heart. Okay, Now, the reason why I'm going into that right now is just to describe this issue of how do you become a part of the, the family of God? We, we're, we look at it as a structure, right? As a, as a building. We think about it as a spiritual house. But what really is that? When we get down to the nitty-gritty of it, it's in connection with what takes place the moment we believe the Gospel the, the change, what God does the moment we believe. So come over to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at another word and to describe what takes place. Look at verse 1, Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Jump down to verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath 
quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. So there's a quickening that takes place. So when the gospel is heard and received, there's, an, there's a whole host of things that take place right at this point. There's a, there's a quickening. Quick. There's a, there's a washing of, of a wash of regeneration. Okay? There's a circumcision. We're not going to look at this one, but a circumcision without hands. When that redemptive work packaged in the gospel of the grace of God is extended to an individual in their heart, when that heart receives it by faith, there's an operation that takes place. It's that regeneration, it's that operation that changes our identity from Adam to Christ and therefore from belonging to the devil being our father to God our father to being to Christ being our brother that he might be the firstborn among many brethren joint heirs with Christ okay sons and daughters of God so he's the chief cornerstone he's the one that provides for it he's the he's the foundation but then we get built upon that when we go into Christ, when there's a regeneration, when there's that operation that takes place. Okay? Uh, come back to Ephesians chapter 2 and down to those verses 19 through 22 there. The entire building of what God is building in Christ is, is upon Christ and in Christ. And notice what he says in verse 21. He says, in whom, that's in Christ, all the building, that would be individuals who have this regeneration, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. A holy temple in the Lord. Now what was the, what was the temple in the Old Testament? And, and, and even the, the Gentile temples. It was the place in which their gods were, right? It's the place where, with Israel, God dwelt. There's the, there's the presence of God in connection with the temple. But now he's saying they are the temple of God. Look at verse 22. In whom ye, ye also are built together for an habitation of God, through the Spirit. The, the a habitation is a place to dwell. It's a place of abode. It's where one abides. A, a, a settled dwelling. That's what a habitation is. And here we're told that ye, he says in verse 22, ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Ye are the habitation of God through the Spirit. God inhabits us through the Spirit. Now let's look at some things in connection with this. Um, come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you don't have the verses in the back of your mind, let's just quickly run through them. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and jump down with me to verse 16. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? He's posing the question, a rhetorical question in the sense that they should know that this is the case. Or how would they know this? Well, they would have learned Romans doctrine before all this, even though Romans is written after it. But look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And look at verse 5. Romans 5 and verse 5. He says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Notice, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Which means, where does the Holy Ghost dwell? In our hearts, right? So it's, He sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So the moment we believe the gospel of our salvation, 
we, that wash and regeneration that takes place by the Spirit also makes us habitable, if I can put it that way, uh, of, for God through the Spirit to inhabit us. Okay? And the Spirit is given unto us. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. The spiritual operation makes it so that He can inhabit us. Romans chapter 8, and just for time's sake, uh, pick it up here in verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. That's what has taken place. The Spirit of God has, is dwelling in them. It says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to God. If you have the Spirit of Christ, you belong to Him. You are one of His. If you don't, you are none of His. And if you have the Spirit of Christ, then the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. You're His abode. You're His dwelling place. And of course, we know in connection with the sealing of the Spirit, that is a permanent thing. That's a permanent thing. And therefore, because He inhabits us, we become the temple of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. By the way, don't get any, let's not get strange ideas as if you now are God. It means that through the Spirit, He inhabits you. And we're going to take a look at more of this here as we go along. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And look at verse 19. He says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which which ye have of God, your inhabitation of God through the Spirit, and ye are not your own. Remember, you're His. Right? We saw that in Romans 8. Verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. See, this... He, he paid the payment, and then in the Gospel, when you believe it, by virtue of the, the Spirit, now in you, and all those things, you become also bought. And He paid it in full. We know that. Okay? And so He says in verse 20, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And look later down in the text, down to verse 16. He's talking about being unequally yoked together with unbelievers in verse 14, but come down to verse 16. He says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now he's, in one sense, talking about the issue of the, what we wouldn't think about when we think about the temple of God in regards to the structure of Idols aren't supposed to be in the temple of God. That's, that's where God dwells. But notice what he does here now in verse 16. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And, and, and the, uh, that's changed from where Paul's quoting it. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a, what? A father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So you have this issue, again, of the the family concept, uh, but you also have this issue of us being the, the temple of the living God, and God dwelling in us through the Spirit. All right? Now, how, what is that change? What is part of that change that takes place to make it so that He can inhabit us? Come with me to Romans chapter 6. It's part of that spiritual operation. And look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Speaking of our baptism into Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection, He says in verse 6, Knowing this, 
that our old man is crucified with him. Here's the purpose. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Our body was the body of sin. It belonged to sin. We were none of God's and we were one of sin's. If I can put it that way. We, our body was not yet bought. Our, our body was a body of sin. But by virtue of the operation of, of regeneration that takes place in the circumcision without hands and being bought and being quickened, these things that take place the moment we hear the Gospel and, and being baptized in, this, in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, this body is bought and that operation makes it so that we're Christ. And the things that take place with our body allow God to inhabit it through the Spirit and also utilize this vessel that still has sin in it to glorify Him. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 6. Therefore, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your what? Body and in your spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This body is no longer a body of sin. It has sin in it. But it does not belong to sin. It belongs to God. And we're able to utilize it. And it's where the Spirit dwells. And now we're allowed and we're able to disobey sin. Look at Romans 6 verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Sin can still reign in our mortal body, but he's saying, let it not. It says that ye should obey in the lusts thereof. We can now disobey sin in our bodies because of this spiritual operation, because of this quickening, this regeneration, this circumcision and baptism, and because we have the Spirit that dwells in us. And we know that the Spirit dwells in us And we know we have Him permanently. And therefore we can walk after the Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 8. Without the Spirit, we cannot walk after the Spirit. Uh, Pick it up here in verse 5. He says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So, how do we become a part of the household of God? How do we become a part of the family of God? It's when we hear the gospel, and from the heart we believe it, and there's these, all these things that take place that God works within us, this spiritual operation, this spiritual surgery, so that He can inhabit us, inhabit us through the Spirit. Now, as we move to the next part, the issue of edification, we must ask ourselves, is in, by virtue of having the Spirit of God, is there anything in connection with what God wants to give us that we don't have. We have everything by virtue of the Spirit. Look at, um, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let's just look at this, these verses here for a moment. Verse 9. When we move to this issue of edification, in other words, God building us up. There is in one sense that that is a corporate issue. How, how does God build His church? Well, He wills that all men be saved and come to knowledge of truth. When someone is saved and they're regenerated, they get added to the church. They get added to the, to the body of Christ. They get added to the household of God. They get added to the, to the family of God. They're now identified with that, that family of God. But there's also an issue of building up us, uh, us, uh, building us up in the inner man in which the Spirit dwells. And here's the two things I want you to understand. By virtue of having the Spirit, we have all. However, just because we have everything doesn't mean we know everything that we have. And that dichotomy is over and over and over again communicated by the Apostle Paul in the Scriptures. 
And therefore, when you believe the gospel, you become a part of the household of God, and yet there's still an issue of building. Okay? And I want to illustrate that just from, for, uh, from this passage for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 9. It says, But as is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man. Where are we now? Where did he bring us into? He brought us into the heart of man, right? That, that, that I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. In other words, there's some things that God has prepared for them that love him. How do we love God? We believe the gospel. He, we love him because he first loved us. I know John says that, but this is God commended his love for, towards us, and yet while we got sinners, Christ died for us. We meet him at that point in believing in that work. And that's our, by, when we believe from, that, from the heart, that's our love. And, and that's our love towards God. And therefore, belonging to Him, He has prepared some things for them that love Him. But the natural man and the natural generated man in the wisdom of the world don't know what those things are. Okay? But here's the, here's the thing. Just because we get the Spirit the moment we believe also doesn't, mean, also doesn't mean that we know what those things are. It means that we, what? Can know what those things are. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. So we have the Spirit of God, but then God hath revealed those things by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things Yea, the deep things of God. So one of the things that we were, we were watching as a family, um, we were watching a, a, a video, fearfully and wonderfully made, in, in regards to um, conception and, and the, the egg and the, the seed of the man and all these kind of things. And what was amazing uh, is to learn about this, this moment of fertilization and everything that it takes to get there. Uh, I also read an article probably about a year ago where it said that scientists, by, by virtue of, the, I think it was in vitro, when the, the artificial insemination or whatever, is that when the sperm, when the egg receives the, the sperm, the seed, there's a, they, they slow down the process, and guess what happens? There's a flash of light. An amazing thing, they have it recorded. There's, there's light, there's life that takes place naturally, so too uh, spiritually. But one of the things that they described is that, that the, the fertilized egg now that's, that's, that's going towards the uterus has its, has its own um, nourishment until it's able to get to the uterus and the placenta is built in, and then you have another source of nourishment. And I, I couldn't help but thinking about the, the, the nourishment, and the nourishment is the Word of God. And early on in the infancy stage of the church, the body of Christ, you had spiritual gifts were the fundamental nourishment of the church. But they would provide for uh, a different nourishment, a nourishment that would come from the, the perfect, the, the Word of God. And, and that would be the nourishment. And then eventually, right, when there's a deliverance of the child, sure, there's still nourishment, but it's a now a different kind of nourishment. It's milk, right? And then you move to meat. And the way I view that in, in keeping with my spiritual analogy is that in the resurrection, we get a new body and we're able to have a different kind of nourishment than what we have right now. The, the things that we'll be able to know and the things that we'll be able to do with that, with that new body uh, are, are amazing. But I, I wanted to bring that up is because there is in one sense... When the seed fertilizes the egg and new life is given, there, there is everything that that life needs to live. All the nourishment it needs to live is there. And when we have the Spirit of God in our hearts, all the nourishment we need is there. But the issue in regards to, to our spiritual life is we need to come to know it and understand it. And therefore, that's how He builds us up individually. That's the, the process of edification is not only 
that we would be saved and become a part of His household, but we would come to the knowledge of the truth. That issue is so important. And so, we've already seen we are God's building. We've already seen that that is all marked by the Spirit of God that has been given to us. We've already seen that we have the Spirit of Christ if we believe the Gospel, and therefore we are His. This, we, we've seen that the Spirit of God it, it is utilized to reveal the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. Look at verse 10 here of chapter 2, 1 Corinthians. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What did the Spirit search? All things. All things. Hold your hand here, because we're going to come back here. But look at Romans chapter 8. I referenced it. Um, one we were singing or in my prayer. I can't remember. But look at Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us what? All things. He's freely given us all things. The issue is, we don't know what all the things are. And God wants us to know what those things are. And just because we possess and, and he dwell, the Spirit of God and He dwells within us doesn't mean we automatically know. We have to engage in a process of what the Spirit unfolds and the Spirit reveals by way of His Word to know. Now, come down to verse 12 of back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. If He spared not His own Son, how shall He not also freely give us all things? Right? He's freely given us all things. The issue here now is that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And so here's sometimes the mistake that we have as, as, as grace believers is to quote verses, and I've done this, guilty as charged, but quote verses, I'm complete in Him. But allow that to be in such a way that we don't know what that completion is. To don't, we don't know what that means. Or, uh, you know, this issue of that I am blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But not know what the spiritual blessings are. And the things that are ours are given to us that we might know them. And that interaction also takes place. So, you have the, you have the, the Gospel and the Word here. If I, can, if I can just draw another circle. Oh, maybe. I'm going to call it the Word of Christ. Now, we could go into and talk about how those are similar, <laughs> but just for illustration, you have, you have the Word of Christ that contains all, all things. And guess who teaches us those things? The Spirit that is in us. And guess how that interaction is supposed to go? The same way of what we what took place the moment we believed. We believe it. Now let me show you a couple verses in regards to that. Look at Romans 8 and 1 Thessalonians 2. Romans 8 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Romans 8 first. And I just want you to see the interaction of, the, of our inner man and the Spirit of God. Uh, just, in, just grabbing one verse. Romans chapter 8, and look at verse 16, if you will. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our, what? Spirit. See, before we believed the Gospel, before we were regenerated, the wash and regeneration, our spirit was dead. Uh, that's described in Ephesians chapter 4. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and the, our foolish heart was darkened, right? And, and walked in the vanity of our mind, and... and and alienated from the life of God. But when we believe the gospel, now all that began to change. And now there's this issue that we can communicate with God. 
not in and of some mystical way, but in the nourishment that He provides. And what it does is starts to build us up and grow us. Not in the sense of that we don't have the Spirit, but in the sense of the things that the Spirit has to reveal, that has revealed, but to, to teach us, we are now coming to know it. Okay, Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and see it here in just a slightly different way. Verse 13. I, listen, I know I'm grabbing a whole bunch of verses uh, from different places, but this is, these are the ways in which Paul articulates these things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when He received the word of God, which He heard of us, He received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what believe. So this, this word of God, the word of Christ, that has all these things that the Spirit is going to teach us, how are we going to get them to work? We've got to believe them. Just like when we believe the Gospel and the Spirit went to work, not us, but the Spirit went to work and did all those things, the Word of God, after we, after we believe the Gospel, the Word of God becomes the issue and we are to believe it and it effectually worketh. What does it work? Becomes the, kind of the next question. Before we deal with that, I want you to see some passages that, that show this issue of growing and perfecting. Come back over to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And here with the, when the, the spiritual gifts of the communication of the Word of God were in operation, they were for a purpose. Look at verse 12 of Ephesians 4. He says, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, that is the issue of maturation. It's the issue of growth and development. And therefore, we can't again confuse the issue of being complete in Christ or being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus to mistaken that there is a perfecting work that needs to be done. He says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The perfecting of the saints is part and parcel of the edifying of the body of Christ. So we become a part of the household of God. We become a part of this building the moment we believe. And therefore, by virtue of us becoming a part of the building, He is building His house. But there is a... There is a, a an element that continues on building up. And what is that component? Receiving the Spirit all over again? No, we already have that. Getting the blessings? No, we already have them. The, the edifying of the body is through the perfecting of the saints, which is knowing what has been freely given to us. And what that does is it grows us up in the Christ. So we can be in Christ, but not grown up in Christ. So look at Ephesians chapter 4 uh, once more. Look, come down to verse 15. He says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in what? Now we've seen those all things, right? They've been freely given to us. How shall He not freely give them to us? Right? Romans 8. He prepared them and therefore they're freely given to us because He loves us. But the issue becomes grow up into Him in all those things. There are more things to know about Christ than just that He died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again. As, nece as necessary as that is, there's so much more. That He ascended in His glory and, and who He is, and what He's like, and what He does, and how He thinks. And all those things, in one sense, are conflated. But in another sense, the Spirit of God reveals them, and has revealed them, they're in His Word, and now we're able to learn about that, and to grow up into Him, which is the head of Christ. Jump down to verse 17. Verse 17. 
He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all in cleanness with greediness. But ye have not so, what? Learned Christ. It so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. Well, who ultimately teaches us about Christ? The Spirit of God. Through the vessel of the Apostle Paul. Right? But, it's the Spirit of God that teaches us. We didn't look at that in 1 Corinthians 2, but you can go back and look at it yourself. He teaches us comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so, there's an issue of growing and maturing, perfecting, not sinless perfection, but growth and development. All right? Look at, uh, come over to uh, Colossians with me. Come with me to the book of Colossians. This issue is something that the Apostle Paul was aware of and, and mightily involved in. For time's sake, pick it up here in verse 21. He says, Whom we preach, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man, what? Perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice how he doesn't say that we may present every man in Christ Jesus. He's got something in view. He's got to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To, to, so that the ones that are in Christ know what has been freely given to them. And those things that have been freely given to him ultimately is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's, he's given them his Son. And freely everything with His Son. Remember, we've been quickened together with Him. We've been raised together with Him. We've been seated together with Him. He made Christ to be unto us our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That means He's our justification, He's our purification, and He's our glorification. But He also made Him to be unto us wisdom. We see in Philippians, He's the, the, the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Knowing Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The issue of the, the image. We behold with open face as, a, 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 as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And we are changed from glory to glory. That same image by the Spirit of the Lord. And the Lord is that Spirit. And so really the Spirit of God teaches us and identified as the Spirit of Christ teaches us more and more about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that knowledge... There's a perfection to it. There's a growing and maturing. Look at verse 29. Whereunto, this Paul presenting every man perfect in Christ Jesus, I also labor, striving according to His working, which worketh in me mightily. God is working to make you a habitation for Himself, through the Spirit, but in view of that, to build you up and to perfect you in your inner man. And it's ultimately Christ in you. It's ultimately Christ in your inner man. Now we see the terminology in verse 27, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, Get two places, just jump back to a little bit earlier on in Colossians chapter 1 and get Ephesians chapter 3. Look at first earlier on in Colossians chapter 1 and look at verse 9. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We have the Spirit of God. Of course, He knows the deep things of God. That's why He's able to teach us 
And although we have the Spirit of God, doesn't mean we automatically know all those things. We have to participate in that process. And Paul's praying that you might be filled with all the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And notice where all this is. Come over to Colossians chapter 2 and pick it up in verse 2. He says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love. What is, what's going to join each member of the household? is the issue of what is taking place in their hearts. Being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of Father and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we need to know Christ because in Christ is hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And it's the Spirit of God that searched those deep things has revealed them so that we might know them and grow in Him. This is the edification process. Not just being added as a part of the building by virtue of regeneration, but to build us up. Now, I said Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and then we're eventually going to come over to Colossians chapter 3. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. And look at his prayer here now. So again, we've already read verse 14 and 15 as we started out. Verse 16, he says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. Where? Now how is He going to strengthen us with might by His Spirit? Ultimately, to teach us Christ. Verse 17, that when that strengthening with might by His Spirit in inner man, what's the purpose of it? Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. If let me just grab a kind of a quick example off the top of my head. If if Christ overcame the world and we know Christ and we know he overcame the world, then we know we can overcome the world. And by that I don't mean we'll be resurrected. But the issue of not being uh, not faint and grow weary based upon the hindrances and the obstacles that we face in this world that want us to be weak that want us to faint instead of being strengthened. And we need to be strengthened. And that is done by His Spirit in the inner man. We possess the Spirit, but there's a strengthening effect of the Spirit that comes from those things that He knows of Christ, of course, that we need to know. And when we know it, and when we believe it, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now come over and look at the parallel sister passage to that in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and look at verse 6. uh, Pick it up here in verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So he's dealing with the issue of the hearts. To which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Well, wait, wasn't the Spirit dwelling in us? It was. But the Spirit searches the deep things of God, the things prepared for us who love God, things freely given to us of God, all things, right, He's going to freely give to us, that we have, that the Spirit teaches us and interacts with our spirit, and with our heart we then believe, and we come to know, and by virtue of our reception of it, just as when our heart believed the Gospel, we got the Spirit of God. So now our heart, when the Spirit of God teaches us those things, we are perfected and we grow in Christ to the point where the Word of Christ, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The issue of the heart. Ultimately, it's Christ. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And come down if you will. Earlier on in the passage, he talked about what the Spirit of God is writing on the tables of our heart. And then in verse 17, he says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty. 
but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The things freely given to us of God really is more and more of His Son. That the Spirit of the Lord knows and teaches us so that Christ, that we can grow up in the Christ in all things. To be filled with all that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Come back over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And look at verse 19. He says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be, what? Filled. There's a growing, there's a perfecting, there's a filling that He wants. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, where's the fullness of the Godhead bodily? It's in who? In Christ. So when the Spirit of God reveals those things that He knows, that He's searched out, all those things, yea, the deep things, and He teaches them to us, we now have in His Word. And we come to learn those things and hear Him and be taught by them. That's more and more of Christ. And if Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily and Christ is dwelling in our hearts by faith, our body now is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the habitation of God through the Spirit for Christ to dwell in our hearts by faith that we can be filled with all the fullness of God. Look at chapter 4 when he says this. In verse 13, he says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. See, we're a new man. The issue is that new man being perfected unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And there is individual application to this and corporate application regarding the church at, at large, the church of the body of Christ. So, in just the, the couple minutes I have remaining, how is it then that we engage in edifying? If we become a part of the household of God and He's building His house by us becoming a part of it by the washing of regeneration and that spiritual operation and therefore the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And there's a process of edification by those things that are freely given to us of God are being taught by us by the Spirit that we have by His provision of His Word that He's using to teach those things to our inner man that Christ may dwell in our hearts in this, in this uh, uh, perfected sense, this, this issue of growing and maturing sense, how is it that we can engage in edifying? Well, look at Ephesians chapter 4, and look at verse 15 again. He says, "...but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even in Christ." we get to speak the truth. The Word of Christ dwells richly within us. Well, what are, we, what are we to do with the Word of Christ? Well, he says, sing it to one another in that passage, didn't he? Colossians 3. So we speak it to one another. We, we communicate it to one another. We get to labor with God and what He's taught and what we've learned and what we've heard and what we've come to know to be able to communicate and teach it with others. We speak it. In love. He says, verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working. Remember, the effectual working of it, the, the Word of God effectually worketh in them that believe. The, the truth, effectual work, working in the measure of every part, because they're believing it, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now it's not just. Now it's not only it is all the Spirit of God, but He's using vessels in, in, in aid to build the body of Christ. It's, it's the Word of God in others being communicated and spoken that we can build each other up. All the more better, of course, when we have the Word of God and we can use the word, words of God. Let's end over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we speak the truth in love. 
Look at, that's how we engage in edifying. But that which was given to us, Christ in us, working towards others. If Christ is dwelling in the hearts by faith, in the inner man, right, of an, another, and that is being expressed to another, and that other member is expressing to them, now there's a knitness, a, a, a joined, a, a compactedness that's taking place. Look at verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God is faithful by whom ye were called under the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you understand maybe some of that sense of fellowship if you, if you didn't know before. Verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Communicate that word of Christ. And that there be no divisions among you. Because it's Christ. He says, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He talks more about that if you want to know a little bit more about that in Philippians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 2. Well, I wanted to run through this and just communicate once again for us the issue of what God's doing today regarding the church, the body of Christ. His, his household that He's building is essentially the issue of Him inhabiting you through the Spirit. And how that takes place, the issue then of not only that you become a member of His household, or you become a, 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 a child of God and a son and daughter of God, but there's a, a perfecting, there is a growing, there is a maturing in the things that you have access to, that have been freely given to you. Um, we ought not come along and say we, we have these things without knowing them. He tells us both. You have them and know them. And if you know them, you come to know them, that's working more in your heart. It's strengthening you. And it's actually Christ developing. Christ growing in you and that's what god wants and for you to be filled with all the fullness of god what an expression what an amazing thing of what he is working to get to and what he did the moment we believed and what his word is able to accomplish and then for us to be able to labor together with him in this whole operation let's pray father we thank you for this time to examine your house your edifice us being the church, the body of Christ, us being a part of that household, what it is to become a part of it, uh, but also what you're doing in, in building it. And that perfection, not sinless perfection, but growing up into Him in all things. All the things set forth in connection with Christ and the instructions and the knowledge that we're supposed to know to gain that, to benefit from it, and to, to grow more and more in it all. And that's what we want. That's, all we, what's, that's what we should want, just as Paul. Count everything else done, dung, but see that there's an excellency in knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.